Welcome to Versus History with Elliot Watson and Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Versus History. My name is Dr. Elliot L. Watson, and with me is Patrick O'Shaughnessy. How are you, Patrick? Good afternoon, Elliot. Um, just a little word on our previous podcast. The last one on the Cuban Missile Crisis was very, very well received. The number of downloads was was fantastic. We've had a great response to the podcast. Other educators chipping in with ideas for podcasts, and this is today one of those ideas. Patrick, what do you think? Certainly is, yes. I mean, in terms of suggestions for podcasts, we've almost been inundated. We've had the Indian Mutiny, a raft of ideas on Nazi Germany, American Revolution. We've had suggestions from our own students. It's just really incentivizing and zesty to get lots of great ideas. Would you like to uh, give us an overview of what exactly we will be discussing today? Of course, a potentially controversial topic because the most preeminent historian of the topic calls the gentleman we're discussing a controversial general. We are discussing field Marshal Haig yes, we are. of World War One. Has history misjudged Field Marshal Haig, essentially? That, yes. Is that the crux of it? <laughs> that is the crux of the argument. Even I remember when I was uh, at school 20, 30 years ago, it was really a matter of Haig was a monster, just to what degree was he a monster? And of course, that is not only wrong, it is mm. deeply un fair. But our arguments today are going to revolve around whether the reputation that he has had over the last 100 years, either positive or negative, is deserved. We're not putting Field Marshal Haig on some sort of metaphorical proverbial trial nope, here today. No, absolutely not. Um, he had a job to do and he did it. He broke no laws of warfare as far as I am aware. Yes, now I will be arguing Field Marshal Haig's reputation as, I hesitate to say butcher, which is the, the term I was taught when I was a student. I'm going to argue from that perspective that he deserves a critical and negative reception from academics and historians. And Patrick is going to argue... I am going to argue that essentially he did his job to the best of his ability during World War One, and not only that, he had the objectives put before him, which was to win the war for the Allied powers. So, where do we begin, Patrick? That's a difficult one, because Mr Haig lived a long life in the military forces, and I will start of World War One, if we may, in 1914. World War breaks down, and I think it's worth remembering that this was a war like no other. It was totally total attritional warfare on a global scale, hence the tag World War One. Mm -hmm. A deadlock had developed on the Western Front by 1915 and it was very very clear to Britain that their current leader Sir John French was not up to the task so he was replaced in December 1915 by Field Marshal Haig. Field Marshal Haig had had a long distinguished military career including the Boer War. Indeed though we must take into account the Battle of the Somme. The Battle of the Somme, the first day on the 1st of July, goes down in one of the costly, if not the most costly in British military history. 20,000 British soldiers dead, 60,000 casualties. And who was in charge on that day, Patrick? That was Field Marshal Haig. I see, so you're arguing for my <laughs> side again, is that right? Well, Field Marshal Haig was definitely in charge that day, although obviously I'm going to counter that he was mandated to do so by his superiors, the British government. Field Marshal Haig retained control of the British forces until the very end of World War One, which we must note concluded on the 11th of the 11th 1918. Technically an armistice was signed but the de facto reality was the British were victorious along with their French allies. When Field Marshal Haig died in 1928 his funeral was the highest attended event in the interwar period. Am I right in thinking 200,000 yep. uh, former soldiers uh, marched by his coffin to pay their respects? They did. The controversy stems from essentially the, the 1960s, a book by Alan Clark, The Donkeys, indicating that those that led the British Army, i.e. Haig, were the donkeys and the lions were those fighting under their command. There was also a film, Oh What a Lovely War, which mocked the British leadership during World War One. And then who can forget in the 1980s, Black Adder, where the British generals, including Haig, were mocked for the folly of their tactics. There the story concludes, or does it? Because in recent years with Professor Gary Sheffield, there has been some revisionism on Field Marshal Haig's reputation. The balance has somewhat, or the pendulum of historiography has swung the other way, indicating that he may not deserve the reputation that had been attributed to him in the aforementioned period in the 1960s. The basic uh, trend here is that immediately after World War One, the reputation was largely intact, 
a field yes, marshal. Yes, as Hague. far as I'm aware. Um, yeah. Then, towards the middle of the century, we had a, a response or a reaction by many historians led by Clark against his contribution. And then we have the pendulum, as you quite rightly say, swinging. It seems in the the other direction by uh, led leading the charge is Dr. Sheffield. So. Who has incidentally wished us all the very best for this podcast, so we thank him for that. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, I am now about to call him an apologist, however, (laughs) (laughs) for uh, for Field Marshal Haig, for a number of reasons that we'll we'll come to uh, as we go along. But I think it's important to state, if if I am to discredit a reputation, then it's important to establish what that reputation was. So, Patrick, what would you, uh, how would you sum up his reputation? Stoic, a man that Britain could depend on in its hour of need to dig in in an unprecedented situation see the job through a bloody job in every sense of the word see it through to a successful conclusion that I would like to be as Haig's enduring reputation a man that got done what he needed to get done in horrific unprecedented circumstances i.e. attritional mechanized warfare in mud rain against the horrors of barbed wire entrenched redoubts a man that got done what he needed to get done and furthermore what the nation needed to be done without recourse to advanced technological offensive strategies and weaponry. From my understanding, my reading, a lot of the historians tend towards saying that Field Marshal Haig's contribution eventually bore out. And they keep using the words eventually. And that, to me, is an indicator of a lack of confidence in what he actually was able to achieve. Uh, We mentioned this last uh, podcast when we talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes. If we are to judge the success of anything, we need to first figure out what the objectives were. And a number of the historians, including Jonathan Boff as well, and B. H. Liddell Hart, they say that, well, by most objective measure of success, Haig was a failure. And if we talk about the objectives for the Somme, what were the objectives for the Somme? His objective, first and foremost, this was not off his own back. This was not an ad hoc decision to fight the Somme. He was compelled to by the French failings in Verdun. The French were being bled white and the line essentially was about to be broken. A breakthrough on behalf of the Germans through the French lines at Verdun was imminent. Therefore, Haig was ordered to undertake offensive action at the Somme in order to relieve the pressure from the French. So he had no choice about being offensive because the government had told him to. Where does his responsibility actually lie for the victory, the so-called victory? I think what what we have to look at is he was given the order or the mandate to advance, but it was up to him about how how that was going to be seen through. But advance he had to. Um, He was ordered to by Lloyd George and the British government. So he had no choice in that. Furthermore, if he didn't, the line was going to break and the Allied, Allied war effort was going to crumble and capitulate. So he did have no choice in as far as that. But in terms of the conduct of the war, he was the Supreme Commander of the BEF, so yes. he, how that was going to be actioned was completely up to Haig. If we talk about the Somme, you mentioned the Somme as a battle. Yes, um, it, it's it's always a struggle, and this is the this is the point. It's very it's a very emotive subject because of the number of casualties at the Somme. You're talking about hundreds of thousands um, over the course of the battle. Uh, first day, twenty thousand dead, sixty thousand uh, as casualties. John Keegan he emphasizes the tragedy of the battle. In fact, he says the battle was the greatest tragedy of their military history and marked the end of an age of vital optimism in British life that has never been recovered. That's pretty damning. Yes since the man in charge of operations, strategy, planning, was Field Marshal Haig. We have to look at what the alternative was and, and the me- mechanisms and means available to him. At the start of the Battle of the Somme in July 1916, defensive formations, i.e. the trench, they were pretty accomplished. Barbed wire, machine guns, redoubts, quagmire of mud between yep. the two trenches. However, offensive technologies and capabilities had nowhere near kept up. So in terms of taking the fight to the enemy, that was a very, very, very dangerous thing to do. Haig was essentially forced into a corner. He knew there would be casualties. So you were right, Elliot, to highlight the fact this is a highly emotive event. However, we must not let the view of the first day of the Battle of of the Somme cloud the view of the rest. The remaining five months, essentially, it was overall a victory because it did save the French, which was its primary objective. But also the British did manage to gain ground at, at the Somme over the five months albeit the first day being a bloody disaster in every sense of the word. Can I just 
to come back to this idea of, of uh, you mentioned this this was a war of uh, of new technologies. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, many historians have often criticised Haig for underusing, underappreciating these technologies. Um, but uh, I'd just like to, to, to mention what uh, Dr. Sheffield himself said. He said that if we do have a criticism of Haig and mm. the new technology, it wasn't that he didn't adopt that new technology. He used it too early. He used it too early and he was too heavily reliant upon it. He believed that, particularly at the first battle of the Somme and uh, uh, the first few days of the Somme, but continued using a strategy strategy of uh, massive artillery bombardment, uh, believing that this would either demoralize the Germans or break through the barbed wire line yes. or break out um, and and then to be followed by by the infantry. And it was this enthusiasm, this belief that, that this new technology um, would be some kind of uh, solution to this this intractable stalemate. A silver bullet, excuse me. A silver pardon. bullet, absolutely. Uh, and his over on on chlor oh, sorry, over reliance on chlorine gas because he assumed it would be a better weapon. His over reliance initially on tanks because he figured that it would be a better weapon. Um, that to me uh, uh, does not speak to somebody who did not understand the technology. It was somebody who actually expected more from it, and therefore once again he has been placed in a position where he simply misunderstood uh, the, that, that current technological value. I would, that's a very good point. I'm going to argue to the contrary, also by quoting um, from Professor Gary Sheffield. The quote is, he was not a Luddite or technophobe, which concurs with, with that, that which you said, and may, and may challenge people's preconceptions of Haig. Much of his, his use of technology came in the Boer War. For instance, in 1898, he was a big pro proponent of the use of the machine gun. Uh, and, and you're right. A quote from Sheffield is, Haig was too enthusiastic and expected too much from tanks. But I'm going to argue to the contrary. I'm going to say he actually learnt during this experience. And this was a massive learning curve, the most brutal and bloody learning curve that any general could have gone through. We must bear that in mind. This was unprecedented. The scale, the ferocity of World War I, this was new. By 1916, Haig's education in this regard had really borne fruition because he understood that tanks were fragile, temperamental, and they were really in their infancy. So in terms of relying on the tank, I would argue the contrary. He maybe didn't use them enough, but then we could also look at the amount of tanks he had. He, he didn't have many at his disposal. De facto reality is they, they, were, they did not play a prominent part in the early saga or episodes of the song. And that's because I think Haig understood that they were not the war winner that we may associate with them being now. Okay, I'm just going to pick you up on this idea of, uh, of, of him uh, yeah. go undergoing a steep learning curve and that he of actually course. learned from the beginning of this Battle of the Somme to the end of the Battle of, course, of the Somme. Yes. Um, he was in the Boer War and that's where he his reputation was made yep. and he was very well aware, in fact it, he, he studied the use of uh, machine guns, yep. uh, so he was very well aware of the functionality, the danger of these machine guns. Uh, he was also very well aware of the use of machine guns in the American Civil War mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the difficulty with strategizing against that. And it's staggering that after this supposed learning curve, he still said in 1915, the way to capture machine guns is by grit and determination. Now, I would suggest that A, he's learned very, very little and, yeah. uh, and B, if he believes that grit and determination is the solution to a machine gun advance yeah. or defense, uh, I'm not sure just how uh, aware he was of the real situation. Now, getting back to that learning curve, he really learned a lot in the song. Why did he then reapply the exact same tactics at Passchendaele? The machine gun was definitely a hugely significant brutal, bloody weapon. However, Haig didn't have much choice above and beyond grit and determination because the tank wasn't yet in use. And the British army that he was working with was still largely a, an army of a raw recruits, amateurs who had just signed up. So that's really all he had at his disposal was grit and de determination. I would suggest he was just making the best of that which he had available. Well, can I just, sorry, can I just jump in there for yeah, a second? Course, because the grit and determination that, that I mentioned, that was not uh, a yep. choice against the machine 
machine gun um, because he absolutely 100% believed in, even as late as 1926, mm -hmm. he absolutely believed in the use of cavalry against machine guns. Now, of course, I know that uh, what many, what some people are calling the, the, the this revisionism or at least this um, this apologist history for Haig, they, they, they say that we heavily, we emphasize too much yeah. his, his belief that cavalry could be successful. But even as late as 1926, he says this, I believe that the value of the horse and the opportunity for the horse in the future are likely to be as great as ever. Aeroplanes and tanks are only accessories to the men and the horse, and I feel sure that as time goes on, you will find just as much use for the horse, the well-bred horse, weirdly, as you have ever done in the past. This is 1926. Okay. Where is the learning curve, Patrick? Okay, in terms of that, I the horse, obviously, we, we cannot contend because history has proved him wrong. However, I think what we need to look at is Hay's conceptual understanding of warfare. He rightly believed in World War One that trench warfare, this static slog, was a temporary phase. But what he was wrong about is that it actually lasted longer than he anticipated. But ultimately, trench warfare was only a temporal part of warfare, although I do concede it lasted longer than he expected. So I believe whilst Haig was wrong about the horse and its value, what he was right about was the overall course of the war. Trench warfare was indeed temporary, and Haig was trying to get to a situation and believed in a situation whereby warfare became more fluid. So in some ways, Haig was a almost ahead of his time you could say, in envisaging the style of warfare that we saw in World War II. Wow, and how was that exactly? By envisaging a scenario whereby warfare was fluid and mobile, and furthermore, where trenches were really just a temporal phase. Do you really see any evidence of, of his belief in fluidity and mobility in World War One? Whether you believe in it, it, that he, he was pioneering attritional warfare or otherwise, there was very little belief in movement. It was simply about suffering fewer casualties than the Germans until the Germans give in. There's no fluidity there. He, he condemns the aeroplane mm. and the tank as a, just mere sideshows. I don't see any fluidity there. They were at the time that they were introduced, which is the time of the Battle of the Somme. They were not war winners in and of themselves. Oh no, I absolutely agree they would. I think I think what we have to look at is, is we have to step back and look at the mandate Haig was given. He had to be on the offensive because the Germans were in France, not the other way around. So sitting back and just waiting in your trench was not an option for him. It was not an option from his paymasters in London, but it wasn't an option in terms of winning the war either. He had to constantly be on the offensive because of where the war was. It was in France. The Germans, on the other hand, could sit back. They were already where they needed that, and wanted to be. That's a very be. good argument. That is a very good um, argument. So if we, if we look at the equation of that which Haig had available in terms of technology, Haig's imperative to attack, the effective defence formations which he was up against, and the limited availability relative new nature of attacking weapons such as the plane and such as the tank. This formula leads us to one conclusion. Haig did the best job that he could have done in the circumstances. His biggest mistake was, and I completely concede to this, once he started offensives which did not seem to be going well, then he didn't stop them quick enough. But, but ultimately he was right to start the offensive. There's a yes, lot in there. Is. And apologies um, for that. Uh, the, this, the idea that he should have stopped earlier, particularly at that next battle at Passchendaele, yeah. we're talking about we're not talking about hours or days that he he did that he 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 went over the time beyond which he should have ceased. We're talking about months. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of lives. That brings me to to this yes. to this point. Him as a man. If we are to look at the number of people dead, I think it's very difficult, and and, and people at the time found it very difficult to reconcile yep. what seemed to be very little success for such high casualties. And I think that's always been the problem with Haig, that ultimately the war was won. You could argue that the, the war was not won really by Britain. They, he simply managed to fend off the Germans for long enough until the Americans arrived, which undermines, I think, this idea that Haig won the war. The other thing is, if we look at him as a man, is it right to characterize him as being this stubborn egotist who, as it says in Blackadder, obviously glibly, uh, simply wanted to move his drinks cabinet a few inches closer to Germany? Because, you you know, even even eminent historians of the 20th century, they criticise Haig for being too far removed from 
the front lines and therefore particularly at Passchendaele some of his subordinates were staggered to see when they went to the front line that they had actually demanded that their soldiers fight in these conditions almost perhaps anecdotally suggesting that they really didn't have that much of an idea of what it was like to be at a front line. I think we have to remember that in, in this era generals and I quote here from historian Robert Toombs generals are like men without eyes without ears without voices because of the limits of technology so I don't think we can criticise Haig as an individual for that because that was indicative of any general for any side. You were somewhat removed. Would you agree that that if, you, if you're going to say that for any general would you say that for say George Washington in the American Revolutionary War? I would say not. Would you say that for Napoleon? I would say not. Would you say that for General Lee? I would say not. Would you say that for the Battle of Trafalgar, would you say that for... Nelson? Nelson! <laughs> Sorry, my mind went completely blank. What, you know, the idea that, that we should revere Haig is anathema to me. He didn't look at the greatest generals. He didn't secure a victory. He just staved off defeat until the Americans relieved the pressure. He was no Napoleon. There was no personality. There was no characteristic. There was no creativity there. There was obstinance. There was stubbornness. There was, there was a, a, a lack of sensitivity and empathy to the point even his own political superiors wanted to remove him. David Lloyd George wanted him gone, and if he'd had the if he did, wasn't in a coalition government, he would have been gone. You had Churchill, who was who eviscerated him, uh, left, right, and centre. Churchill says uh, that devastatingly, um, Haig wore down like the manhood and the guns of the British Army almost to destruction. He says that hopes of a decisive victory grew with every step away from the British front line and reached absolute conviction in the intelligence department, meaning that every single step away from the front line removed these men from understanding what it was they were forcing their men to go through uh, and as a, as a humanist interpretation or even in any objective interpretation I don't see how we should revere this man. I'm not suggesting for one minute we should revere him. I think we should look at the context he was in. Could any other general or field marshal have done any better? The consensus of the historical community is no. To quote Jonathan Both from Birmingham, there was no one better than Haig at the time. The British army was very, very, very small at the start of World War I. I would suggest that Haig was the best man. To quote Gary Sheffield, ultimately, Haig was a winner. His job was to keep Britain and France in the war in the early days when the Germans were on the offensive, which he successfully did. Keeping them in the war and him being a, a hero, the, two different things. No, indeed, I'm not suggesting he's a hero. I don't think there was anyone that could have or would have done anything differently. A, a key point to make here is that the majority of the criticism of Haig subsequent to World War One has come from poets and satirists uh, rather than historians or soldiers. David Lloyd George, who was a serious critic. Uh, we had B.H. Liddell Hart. So these are all eminent historians or commentators. David Lloyd George hated him, but didn't sack him. Because he didn't have a political mandate because he was involved in a coalition government. Which is fair enough, but he also didn't have an alternative. There was no one else that could have or would have done anything different. But that sounds a little bit like a, um, a appointing David Moyes as a football manager. <laughs> There's nobody better at the time. There were really and truly no alternatives to Haig. This, I think we have to contextualise World War One as well. It was a bitter, vicious defensive stalemate. If you're being attacked in World War One, you have the advantage on the Western Front. Unfortunately for Haig, he had to do the attacking. So we need to be careful with how we measure his success. In fact, in World War One, victory and a good performance from a general should be judged by forcing the enemy to submit to your will, which is essentially that which Haig did. The end of the Battle of the Somme, he left the German army in a complete and utter mess. Overall, he kept a very, very small British army in the fight. He saved the French at Verdun by alleviating the pressure. We have to remember the constraints and confines of the time and be careful not to fall foul of the historiography that has come subsequently, which is incidentally, as stated, not from serious academic historians or soldiers who serve themselves. My question to you, Elliot, I suppose, is could anyone have done any different? Well, it's difficult to, to answer that question simply because, once again, that's it's counterfactual. It, it is counterfactual. Uh, secondly, um, I would put to you that there was somebody at the time who was doing almost exactly the same job, and that was uh, French. Um, uh, Sir John French, and he was removed from command for very, very similar reasons 
to that which we criticise, or I would criticise, in Haig for. He was removed for being unable to employ successful tactics, and my view is that Haig did exactly the same thing. An argument that there was nobody better at the time is not a successful argument to judge the heroism or the legacy of a man like Haig. In terms of French's dismissal, one of the attributing factors, as far as I'm aware, was that trench warfare had developed on his watch. When Haig takes the helm in December 1915, he inherits this horrific new stage of warfare, so he had no opportunity to prevent it arising. He subsequently had to play the cards that he'd been dealt. That's a fair enough And they argument. were pretty terrible cards. I don't think Haig had the tools at his disposal, nor a precedent he could refer to, which would help him alleviate the situation to the extent being demanded by the government at the time. There was no way out of this, and he was compelled to attack. Any other general would have had the same mandate and the same limited offensive means and probably the same outcome. Our debate is about an individual. Yes, indeed. The degrees to which an individual can be held responsible for a war, because you just mentioned this yeah. is a what there are wider issues here. Should we remove any and all either blame or praise from Haig simply because we're viewing this from a structuralist interpretation that it was simply the systems and the structures and the context into which he was placed, which means that if that's the case, we must remove the criticism but also the praise? All generals were limited by their ability to be at the forefront of the battlefield. So all generals were essentially limited. Haig was also limited by his mandate, which was an offensive one. Any other mm. general would have to have done the same. If I would critique Haig, it would be that once offensives started to go wrong, he didn't end them soon enough. However, under any other general, those offences would still had to have been made. So there is mm. a structuralist argument to be made. But I, 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 I'm, I still struggle this, with this idea that he that the only criticism for Haig is that he let certain battles go on too long. The, we're talking about months and weeks and hundreds and thousands of people dying here. I'm not sure that we can just absolve him from. Yeah, yeah, he, he did well. But the only criticism is that he, you know, he overcooked the flan. I don't think so. Um, when you're talking about his his in inverted commas only real. Uh, criticism is that he let battles go on too long in the context of World War One. That's just too long. That's that's not an excuse. Could I counter that with another structuralist interpretation from historian Robert Toombs? The fundamental cause of the carnage was not military or social, but political and ideological. Few in England wanted to surrender or even accept the prospect of semi-defeat. So essentially it's the will, it's the viewpoint on behalf of the, of the British system and elite and government that ensured that the war was perpetuated and that Britain had to be on the offensive, ultimately led to the continuation of the war. And given the nature of French warfare, cards were definitely stacked in favour of the defender. Unfortunately, I, Haig had to be the attacker. I mean, that, that's all very well, and I probably agree with that, but it still is, it, it removes any responsibility, positive or, or negative, mm. from the shoulders of Haig. And since we're discussing whether or not he deserves a reputation, there's almost an argument to be made from that perspective that he doesn't deserve any reputation at all. Because if you happen to have been a general at that time, you would have fared in exactly the same way. That seems to be the crux of your argument, that he is simply a replaceable piece of a jigsaw puzzle that was deadly to the tune of hundreds of thousands of men. Is that what we should do? Neither praise nor condemn, just state? We can definitely praise Haig for keeping Britain in the war, having the grit and determination to keep going but we can critique him for carrying on battles too long but I'm going to conclude by quoting a French commander General Mangin who rightly remarks and quote whatever you do you lose a lot of men Haig had no choice but to act within those confines I think that is what I'd like my final contribution to be and I'll, I'll, I'll let you conclude there was no other way there was no other man for the job there was nothing else that could have been done given the nature of trench warfare and the British demand for attack 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 okay. I'll conclude there. Okay, I would just like to conclude with a reinforcement of, of course, this is a very emotive subject that has seen a lot of historical interpretation of particularly this man. But I still, I'm returning to this idea that you keep saying he had the grit and the determination, but yet you keep saying he had no choice. So I'm not there necessarily, I'm not really going to criticise him because I've, I've kind of, through this podcast, arrived at a conclusion that he really did have perhaps no choice 
and therefore made very little contribution to the war because how can we keep saying he, he helped to hold the line through grit and determination when he was simply a player in a very, very large theatre, a very large play, much of it was written and determined and directed by politicians. So he's neither a, he's neither a hero nor a butcher, he's just a man. Shall we conclude there? <laughs> yeah, Dr. let's Watson. conclude there. Okay. Fantastic debate, really enjoyed that one. That, that was, was good. It was difficult because there's so many aspects to this very, very interesting man. It's a difficult subject to talk about being Remembrance Week. Yes, exactly. Uh, November 2017. But it's, it's one that we thought right to take on and many people had requested. That's so. true. If you've got suggestions for future episodes, we are all ears. We do have a bit of a backlog building up though. We do. So you might want to get your suggestion in quick. You can download this from our iTunes page. You can get it from www.versushistory.com and um, I can't wait for next week's one. All right. Gloves are off next week. Thank you very much. See Thank you later, you. Elliot. Thank you very much. See you, Patrick. Thank you for downloading and listening to this edition of Versus History. Subscribe. Visit us at our website, www.versushistory.com.